What makes the achievement of emotional sobriety so difficult is the habits we have, the patterns we have in our behavior, the habitual ways that we've come to think about things. We have to really become aware of those things in order to challenge them because the consciousness that has created a lot of the problems in our life cannot solve it, cannot change things. So what happens is, is the first step is waking up. Tonight, we're going to continue our exploration of how the steps help us um, achieve emotional sobriety, but putting on the lens of how they help us increase our self-esteem, or a better way to say it is how they help us change to a, a more grounded, uh, we called it an authentic self-esteem, a self-esteem that's based on humility. We could call that even a healthy self-esteem. Now, I truly believe that emotional sobriety is contingent on an improved self-esteem, as well as among a few other things like humility, I think is very important, you know, curiosity. We'll talk about other elements of it, but self-esteem is very important. And I just want to remind everyone that Bill said in the 12 and 12 very, very clearly when he started his discussion of, of step 12, that if we practice these principles in our daily affairs, that we and those about us begin to discover self-esteem. So we are now looking at how our, that begin to discover self-emotional sobriety, which as you're going to see means that we're also increasing our self-esteem. So this is a very powerful thing. And now for the last several weeks, we've been talking about self-esteem, how it relates to this step. So I want to kind of look at this from the perspective that we had when we were discussing the steps and how they helped achieve emotional sobriety. So before I talked about that, the steps are designed in a way that they create a charge. And then the next step discharges that charge that was created in the step before it. So there's a charge being created in this step one, when we admit we're powerless, and then we also see and own that our lives have become unmanageable. What it means is that the consciousness that we've had, that we've been living our life with, has not worked that it's, it's, there's a real problem with the way that we've been approaching our life. Now, a lot of people believe, if you are alcoholic, that there's a strong genetic component. But you see, if we have a different kind of a consciousness, when a problem happens and, and we are healthy, we're going to respond to that problem and take care of it. But there's something in the nature of our consciousness that does not, does not permit and allow us to respond well to problems in our life. And a big part of that is denial. We don't want to see who we really are, especially if it doesn't fit with who we think we should be. From the self-esteem point of view, Step one is the beginning of demolishing a consciousness based on shoulds. It's a deconstruction of that consciousness that's based on these ideas about who we're supposed to be to be okay. And nobody's idea of who we're supposed to be to be okay includes being powerless and having a life that's unmanageable. That's just not part of the script for anybody. So now when we're confronted with having to admit and face this reality of our situation, as Bill says, every natural instinct cries out against it, which means that the consciousness that we have, that we come into step one with, 
has a hard time assimilating that information. And this is where the gift of pain and desperation comes in. If we're in enough pain, we're in enough desperation, it creates an awful lot of humility and willingness to try something different. And that begins this process of change. When we now bring into our consciousness that I am powerless, that my life has become unmanageable, I start to deconstruct a consciousness that I've been relying on, and I start to create the possibilities of a new experience, a new experience with myself, a new experience with my problems, a new experience with life, a new experience with my fellows, a new experience with the God of my understanding. I love the discussion we've had so far about self-esteem and self-acceptance. And the thing that I want to point out tonight, and it was mentioned in the last time I was here, and I, I don't know if it was mentioned again last week or not, but that self-acceptance is a prerequisite of change. And so now when we're accepting our powerlessness, we're admitting our powerlessness, we're looking at our unmanageability, it creates a charge. My God, I need to do something about this. I've got a serious, serious condition. I've got a serious problem that's causing all kinds of a mess in my life. And there's nothing that I know that I can do about this the way I am. Something has to be different. I have to be different, but I have no idea what that is. Before, when we talked about the steps and how they create emotional sobriety, I talked about this creating an existential crisis. And it does. It creates a crisis. I can't rely on the consciousness I've been using to live my life and to try to navigate through all these issues. I know that's not working, but I don't have anything new yet. You see the dilemma that it creates? I'm letting go of this or beginning to but I don't have anything to replace it. That's what an existential crisis is, is we're moving, we're letting go of one thing, but we don't have something new yet to rely on, to count on. And that's the charge that's created in this step. That's the charge that's gonna help us start to build a stronger foundation for our life. It's gonna help us build a healthier self-concept a healthier self-esteem, one that helps us stay aligned with reality, one that helps us learn how to cope with life as it is, not as we'd like it to be. And that's why when I say this is the beginning of the deconstruction of a tyranny of shoulds, it becomes very important for us to take that step. Shoulds do not help us live a better life. They interfere with it. That's the bottom line. And you can't have a tyranny of shoulds going on if you're going to have a healthier self-esteem. So there's this charge, this existential crisis that's created. And we're going to hold that charge because next week we're going to start talking about step two. But now let me invite my colleagues in the room and let's hear what their final words are about step one before we move on to step two. So Roger, Herb, and Tom, good evening. Hey. Where's everybody else? Oh, there, there's Roger. There's Raj. And Tom will get a hold of you, I think, in a second. And Herb, are you with us tonight? I do not see Herb. Herb, Herb is missing. No, Herb. <laughs> Well, Herb can never be missing. He will be in our consciousness all evening. We Is there an Amber Alert we can put out for Herb? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tom, it's a silver alert. Uh, it'll, 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 go, it'll go off on everybody's phone at once. Yeah, I like that, a silver alert. Boy, is that a loud noise from our cell phones, right? Those Amber Alerts. Oh, my Tom. God. Well, good evening, you guys. It's good to be back with you. Good to have you back. Yeah. Now, so yeah. Go ahead, Tom. You, if you have some, were you thoughts? gone? It's like um, 
I don't know that I have, you know, it's um, I, I, I actually didn't realize this is our, our, our last on the, on the first step, but, but uh, um, I like it. And I've really enjoyed this, con- this conversation. We've, the, the discussion we've been having uh, and I missed out on some of it at the very beginning, but I but you appreciate you guys let me in on it. It's um, the, you know, I, I, all I really have, I, I have nothing profound tonight. I, I, I want to just emphasize what you're saying, which is, which is, first of all, the thing that I definitely associate with both uh, Nathaniel Brandon and with, with Roger, I, I, I credit it with to Roger because he's the person I heard, heard talk about it before. Uh, it, and it's made a huge difference in, in my way of thinking. It's like, it's that acceptance. It's not even just self-acceptance. This acceptance is always the first, the first step, the first, the necessary first step to change. It's like, it's, I mean, I've, you know, I, would, I, I, I have understood acceptance in the past. This is just a deeper understanding of it. And it's like, and I, but I real, I, and you know, you, until you have a contrast, you really can't see where, where, you know, where I was off or where I, I looked like, I think I was off at this point, which was, you know, I saw, I saw acceptance as a kind of a resignation is like, okay, well, there's nothing I can do about it. So, you know, this, you know, you know, so it's like, I'm, I'm no, and it is part of that. I mean, that is part of the, the deal. It's like, I'm not fighting anymore. So first step, you know, first step of, of my alcoholism recovery is, is acceptance. It's like, you know, I'm not powerless over everything. I'm powerless over the fact that I have alcoholism. I'm, I'm powerless over the tequila boy, you know, lives in my, my, my uh, head and he spent years, you know, uh, ruling over me uh, successfully. And, um, and, and I'm not powerless. I'm not powerless over myself. I'm powerless over the alcoholism. I had to accept that. It's like, but what, what you and Nathaniel Brandon, Roger have, have added to me to that is, is just to really put a po- such a positive spin on that, that it's like, it's, it, and I've been using that with clients. I mean, I've been using it with myself on a regular basis and it's, it's, it really is a game changer. So I, I think that's the thing I want to emphasize that I think is the most important thing that for me that, that I'm seeing as far as putting things into practice is that, you know, the self, you know, the self-esteem is a part of the whole picture. And it is. And I agree with what you say, Alan, it is absolutely a necessary aspect. It's it's I, I used to I used one of the things I used to say to to, to freak people out with the eating disorders is I was I would say, uh say you know if you think you can recover from your eating disorder but not recover from perfectionism you can forget it you know because you know what we want to do is we want to hold that one back you know now, it's not just true for eating disorder people i just you know that's uh but the idea is uh Yeah, that's all. This is, I'm just repeating myself. It's just necessary. It's an absolutely necessary thing to have the self-esteem. And the idea is it's not about accepting. I don't have any self-esteem. It's accepting wherever my, my, you know, as I look through the six pillars and the seven pillars uh, with Nathaniel Brandon stuff. I love one of the things I love about that. That is the idea that it gives me a map and a, and a guide so that basically it's not a matter of do I have self-esteem or do I not have a self-esteem, but when, I, when my self-esteem is suffering, I have a place to go and look and see where, where do I need to focus? You know, what, what part of it, what part of it is, is where I, I need to work rather than, cause you know, we all get too caught up in those all or none things. You know, I need self-esteem. I don't have self-esteem. It's like, you know, no, I got self-esteem, but, but I may be having, having some problems with some of it and that, and that guide gives it to me. So. I don't think that was a very, very eloquent, but um, I love, I've loved this and I look forward to step two. Thank you, Tom and Alan. <laughs> um, I want to start by reading uh, a passage again from the 12 and 12 um, from step one. Uh, started to read it last week and couldn't read my writing. So uh, I went back to it <laughs> at the end of the meeting last week, but I want to repeat it again because it, It reinforces to me so many important messages regarding step one and self-esteem and humility. Mm -hmm. But upon entering AA, we soon take quite another view of this absolute humiliation, referring to the admission of powerlessness and and the Mm -hmm. unmanageability, right? We perceive that only through utter defeat are we able to take our first steps toward liberation 
and strength. And that's the paradox that Alan has mm -hmm. talked about, that in admitting powerlessness, coming out of denial for the first time, and again, this is not only related to, to alcoholism and drug addiction. This expands from there outward into life. By, by coming out of my denial and coming into reality, admitting powerlessness, mm -hmm. I become more empowered. I become more empowered. Yeah. That's the paradox. Our admissions of personal powerlessness finally turn out to be firm bedrock upon which happy and purposeful lives may be built. Well, again, at a common sense level, it's like, wait a second, how can that become firm bedrock, this thing about powerlessness? And I mentioned last week, there seem to be many contradictions on a superficial reading between the 12 steps and self-esteem. The word self is mentioned in every one of those pillars and, and practices related to building self-esteem. Self in the sense of self with a capital S, ego with a capital E, is de-emphasized, right? Throughout, throughout right. what I read and, 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 and have learned in, about 12-step work and, and the program of AA. So, but Alan brought it up this evening, and that's why I wanted to hit this point again. Through the process of letting go of my denial, of letting go of my illusions, including about myself, what Brandon calls pseudo self-esteem, right? A pretense of self-esteem. Mm -hmm. That surrender into reality is how I think of it. That allowing of and embracing of, as Alan said a couple of weeks ago, acceptance is not just about acknowledgement. It's much deeper than that. It's about allowing deeply in. It's about embracing. It's about mm -hmm. being deeply impacted at an emotional level by the reality of what I'm feeling, the reality of my behavior, the reality of other people of life. So mm -hmm. that's the point I wanted to make. It's in surrender to reality, particularly the ones I find it most difficult to surrender to. My own self-centeredness at times would be one for me. Uh, my own excessive other-centeredness at other times would be another one for me, mm -hmm. all right? Just things about reality, where I live that, you know, don't meet my expectations and my shoulds. Those are other people who don't make, meet my expectations and my shoulds. Those realities that I want to ignore, that I want to stay in denial of or even ignorance, just an awareness of. Mm -hmm. It's when I allow myself to come face to face with those truths, something relaxes inside of me. Mm -hmm. Something calms down inside of me. I might still feel confused. There's a famous uh, body-oriented therapist, bioenergetic therapist named Stanley Kellerman, who wrote a book called The Human Ground. And in it, he talks about that place Alan was describing between leaving what's familiar and not yet knowing where we're going. And that that's associated with feelings of confusion. It's created, it's it can be deeply associated with feelings of anxiety and feelings of uncertainty and depression. Um, it can be associated with feelings of that life is bigger than me. I no longer know where I stand. I no longer know what to do, who to be. And that's a normal aspect of the process of change, that kind of uncertainty. Because it's through, as Herb talks about it, it's through, you know, experiencing that mystery, that lack of answers, that we begin to discover the answers that are going to help us. But it's a process and often a very painful and uncertain one. So to me, to go back to the central ideas, genuine self-esteem to me is rooted in humility. It's rooted in an appropriate understanding of my place in the universe, 
And I am not the most powerful being and presence in the universe, right? Far the furthest thing imaginable from it. It's rooted and grounded. Again, humility refers to, you know, the earth, the ground, being in the dirt, right? Being low rather than high. And to me, it's out of that awareness. It's out of that consciousness that I begin to build self-esteem from that bedrock, from that bedrock. I begin to remember the elements, self-respect, including a sense of self-worth and self-confidence. I begin to build it from that groundwork bedrock of humility. Um, Those ideas are incredibly helpful to me. Plus, it gets away from all kinds of grandiose notions about self-esteem or arrogance-based notions. Or there's never, if if our self-esteem is great, we're never uncertain. If our self-esteem is great, we always feel good about ourselves. Bullshit. You know what I mean? Nothing could be further from the truth. You know, and that's the essence of the message. My self-esteem grows when I share my truth whether it's high self-confidence or immense confusion in that moment, whether it's a high level of my sense of self-worth or a non-existent level of my sense of self-worth. My self-esteem grows when I embrace the truth. And that's where I want to finish it for tonight. Well, that's, let me just quick throw one thing. I just so glad you also brought back to this idea. We got to let go before we get what's next. You know, that, 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 that stepping into the, the unknown, it's like, it's, you know, I I tell you, it's like, I've said this before that that one of the things I came away from spending time working on the fear book uh, understanding is that, that human beings fear uncertainty more than we fear anything else, you know, and, and it's, it's like, and this is actually, it's one of those paradoxes, one of those twists. It's like, we pursue if you really want if you want to know about if you want to know humility you step into that uncertainty you know no know, you know knowingly and the truth is and it's like that trapeze artist i, I talked about that i had a client one time when she talked about having to let go of that trapeze before that catcher could could grab hold of her and it's like and i've you know I, she's she's my, my i think about that and i think about just how scary that would be for me you know, she was, she remained very calm in all of that, but it's like, it's like, I appreciate you doing that. Cause, cause I think that's one of the things that I don't think I'm the lone ranger in this group of people that basically I still run into places where I'm waiting to let go of something because I'm waiting for something else to hold on to before I do. And, you know, part, part of God's lousy sense of humor, it doesn't work that way. No. Mm. Uh, that, that's the other thing I wanted to say. See, as our consciousness starts to transform, right, as, as we're starting to build a consciousness that's going to be grounded in, you know, what you're talking about, Roger, this genuine uh, self-esteem based on humility, right? I think we even called it authentic self-esteem at one mm-hmm. point. Is as that's changing, see what we're confronting is a lot of these old ideas about how things are supposed to be, like holding still and feeling something and allow it to move you, as you were talking about, is something that we all were running away from. If I felt any discomfort, my immediate reaction was to get rid of it, not to stay with it, not to, to lean into it not to embrace it, not to flow with it, right? It was, man, it was like touching a hot flame. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. And this step is beginning to shift that dynamic. Now we're holding this paradox that we're powerless and our life is unmanageable. And at the same time, we're living it. What are we going to do? You know, how do we hold that paradox that's now in our hands? Well, we hold it and we let the energy of that experience move us organically towards a solution instead of trying to take control. See, this is where we're tapping into a whole different force that none of us control freaks ever thought was possible because we wanted to know where it was going. Like you said, Tom, right? We wanted the certainty of it. You know, God, I'm going to, I'm going to wrestle satisfaction from this life. Well, maybe not, maybe not. 
Let me let me add one thing to that. Al. You're talking about being able to sit with uncomfortable feelings and our, you know, desire not to do that, to run from them. Just as a personal example, um, when I first moved out to California in 1972 to do therapy with Nathaniel Brandon and study with him, through him, I met a guy named Chuck Kelly who taught people how to do a form of body oriented work, uh, emotional release work, where you lay people down on a mat and work with their breathing and muscle tension and try to help them allow the emotional aspect of their experience to emerge, becoming able to cry or laugh or be angry or be scared. And when I came out here, and wanted to go into this very kind of intellectually oriented work that Nathaniel Brandon did, I didn't think my breathing and my body had anything to do with my emotions. I knew I had feelings, but I didn't think they were connected to what was going on in my body in any way. And I remember, because in the training, I got fascinated with that kind of work and then studied with Kelly, went through a two year training program with him. But as, as, I learned slowly going back and forth between my desire to fight back against those feelings and then allow them or surrender them and then back to the desire to force them away. At first, crying and allowing myself to cry, you know, I ran into all my shoulds, as Alan was talking about around mm -hmm. that. You know, men don't cry. It's weakness if you cry. It's this. But over time, not only did I begin to feel a great sense of release and relief and openness and a, a relaxation of tension when I would allow myself to grieve deeply about experiences that I'd been through and that we've all been through in our lives, I would have this remarkable experience where I would be crying about, you know, experiences I had had that were very painful to me growing up. But even as I would be crying deeply, I would feel so good. <laughs> I would be so happy mm -hmm. at a yeah. deep level simultaneous with that because I was allowing myself to be who I was and I wasn't running any longer from anything. So I just wanted to give that example of what we're all talking about here of, of even in grief, even in rage, even in fear even as we're feeling terror with one aspect of our being, another part of us can be going like, God, thank God, I'm starting to face this. I'm starting to deal with this. I'm not running away from myself anymore into all those diversions that we find. So thank you. Yep. I hear a lot of people criticize the 12 steps that they're old fashioned. I can understand that criticism. They were written back in 1935. Some people that are agnostic have difficulty with the word God used in the steps. For me, I look at the process that's involved, the forces that the 12 steps generate are so powerful that I think they're ageless. There's this interesting phenomena that happens when you work the steps. They create a, a charge and then a discharge. You know, the first step, we're powerless. Our life has become unmanageable. It creates this charge. You know, we're in big trouble and we don't know what to do. And then step two comes along and it says we have hope. That charge, that existential crisis that we have is resolved. What's happening here? is parallel to life. We charge ourselves when we breathe in. When we exhale, we discharge. That's the rhythm of life. And the way I love to think about the 12 steps, it's helping us get connected to the rhythm of life so we can learn how to show up in a good way.